would you confess to a murder you didn't commit? I'm sure answering that took you all of two seconds. No, of course not. Well, this story we're about to tell you might change your mind. This is a story of how the police, prosecutors, and the criminal justice system ruined a teenager's life and continues to do so more than 20 years later. This story has a lot of twists and turns, and by the end of it, you're going to realize just how easy it would be for you or someone you love to be convicted of a crime you didn't commit because you were hundreds of miles away. This is the Presumption of Guilt Podcast. My name is Cindy Missouri, and I covered the story as a reporter in Las Vegas for many years. I want to take you back to Las Vegas, July 8, 2001, around 10.30 at night. A man was foraging around a trash enclosure at Nevada State Bank. At the time, the Palms Casino was under construction right across the street. I think if you can picture a, a trash enclosure that has a chain link roof on it, cinder block, brick surrounding the entire dumpster area. Inside is the dumpster and lots of rubbish and trash. The victim had a fractured skull. His head was badly beaten. Six teeth of his were knocked out. He had been stabbed many times. His throat was slashed. His rectum had been slashed with a knife. His penis had been cut off and was found several feet away. Semen was also found inside of this victim. This was a brutal crime scene. Blood was everywhere. Duran Bailey was not only beaten and murdered, he was tortured. And there was a ton of evidence at that crime scene. Things like pubic hair taken from Duran Bailey's own pubic hair, and that came back to an unknown male. I mentioned the semen, chewing gum, and paper towels that were stuffed into where Duran Bailey's penis had been. There was also male shoe prints size nine, an athletic shoe, and the shoe prints did not match the shoes of the man who called 911 and found the body. There were also tire tracks. Las Vegas Metro Police Department is assigned to this case, and detectives Thomas Thousen and detective James LaRochelle arrive on the scene. Police worked throughout the night, gathering evidence. The following morning, after Detective Thousand and Detective La Rochelle leave the scene, a woman named Diane Parker approaches one of the patrol officers that was still there. Diane Parker tells detectives the man found dead, Duran Bailey, had raped her, sodomized her, less than a week earlier, three days before the discovery of Duran Bailey on July 5, 2001. Diane Parker calls Las Vegas Metro Police and tells the dispatcher she's in fear for her life. Diane says on July 1st, she had friends over who were neighbors. They were at her apartment when Duran Bailey barged in and slapped her. Parker tells police her friends jumped up to defend her and said Duran and her neighbors, her friends, got in a confrontation. According to Diane, Diane's friends warned Duran Bailey to stay away from her. He didn't. Later that day, after that confrontation with her friends, Diane says Duran Bailey came back, anally raped her, put a knife to her carotid artery on her neck, and beat her, leaving her with black eyes. Diane Parker told police Duran Bailey told her he was going to kill her. The discovery of Diane Parker is that she shows up to the crime scene and says, I think I know who the person is who was killed. They go to Diane Parker's apartment, and she lives with a person named Stephen King, and they have a conversation with him. They ask them where they were. This conversation is not recorded. And they look at the bottom of their shoes and that's it. Now reading the transcript of Diane Parker's call with police, Diane Parker, this poor woman who had been raped, then harassed and stalked by Duran Bailey, she asks police for protection. The officer tells her, you gotta do what you gotta do to keep yourself safe. Parker asks if she could kill Bailey if he tried to break into her apartment again. She says, quote, So if he breaks in that door, I have permission to kill his fucking ass, don't I? The officer replies, quote, If anyone breaks in your house, you have a right to protect yourself. That's the law, whatever it takes. Three days later, Duran Bailey was found dead. I mean, I was blown away when I found out that Parker had reported it the week before. And they just blew it off. And she said he's going to kill me. Yes, and so it, it's not remotely surprising that he got dead first. I spoke to an FBI supervisor when I worked on this case in Las Vegas who told me Duran Bailey's murder was so violent, it pointed to it being very personal. The morning after Duran Bailey's body is found, July 9th, police go and speak to Diane Parker, who lives with her boyfriend, Stephen King. In combing through documents for this case, 
there's a lot that's concerning. For me, one of those things is the lack of investigating police did when it came to the rape of Diane Parker. She went into the hospital and had a rape kit done, and police spoke to her. That was it. The report police typed up about the rape of Diane Parker was a paragraph. Is it possible if police had investigated Diane Parker's rape a little bit more, could Duran Bailey still be alive? If he didn't post bail, would he still have been in jail at the time of his murder? A few days after he was found dead, Duran Bailey had three checks written out of his bank account for $125. Despite that, and him being accused of rape and confrontations just days before he was found dead, police say their case went cold. That is until 12 days later when a phone call was transferred to Detective Thousen that would change everything. A teenager two and a half hours away named Kirsten Blaze Lobato with no connection to Diane Parker is arrested for the murder of Duran Bailey. How that happened next on Presumption of Guilt. <laughs>